Introduction For the moment, I am not fucking. I am talking to you. Well, I can have exactly the same satisfaction as if I were fucking. This is the example that Lacan comes up with to illustrate the claim that sublimation is satisfaction of the drive without repression. We usually tend to think of sublimation in terms of a substitute satisfaction. Instead of fucking, I engage in talking, writing, painting, praying. This way I get another kind of satisfaction to replace the missing one. Sublimations are substitute satisfactions for a missing sexual satisfaction. The point that Lacanian psychoanalysis makes, however, is more paradoxical. The activity is different, yet the satisfaction is exactly the same. In other words, the point is not to explain the satisfaction in talking by referring to its sexual origin. The point is that the satisfaction in talking is itself sexual, and this is precisely what forces us to open the question of the very nature and status of sexuality in a radical way. Marx famously wrote that Human anatomy contains the key to the anatomy of the ape, and not, perhaps, the other way around. In a similar way, we should insist that the satisfaction in talking contains a key to sexual satisfaction, and not the other way around, or simply a key to sexuality and its inherent contradictions. Hence the simple, and yet the most difficult, question that orients this book. What is sex? The way in which I propose to approach the question of sexuality is to consider it a properly philosophical problem of psychoanalysis, with everything that resonates with this term, starting with ontology, logic, and the theory of the subject. Psychoanalysis, in its Freudo-Lacanian lineage, has been, among other things, a very powerful conceptual invention with direct and significant resonances in philosophy. The encounter between philosophy and psychoanalysis has turned out to be one of the most productive construction sites in contemporary philosophy. It has produced some impressive new and original readings of classical philosophers and of classical philosophical concepts, such as subject, object, truth, representation, real, and opened a genuinely new vein in contemporary philosophy. At the moment when philosophy itself was just about ready to abandon some of its classical notions as belonging to its own metaphysical past from which it was eager to escape, along came Lacan and taught us an invaluable lesson. It is not these notions themselves that are problematic. What is problematic, in some ways of doing philosophy, is the disavowal or effacement of the inherent contradiction or antagonism they all imply and are part of. That is why, by simply abandoning these notions, we are abandoning the battlefield rather than winning any significant battles. In a similar, albeit not symmetrical way, psychoanalysis, also in its clinical context, has gained a great deal by hanging on to and operating with philosophical concepts and by playing a part in philosophical debates. For in this way it remained involved in the general intellectual landscape its struggles and antagonisms, which it has itself brought to light, rather than enclosing itself in a safely circumscribed, specialised field of expertise and practice. And this was precisely the divide that Lacan kept pointing out, and which has been at the heart of his quarrel with, that is, his expulsion from, the International Psychoanalytic Association. The divide between psychoanalysis as a recognised therapeutic practice appropriately confined to, or allocated, its field, feud, and what seemed to be Lacan's intellectual and practical extravagances, which were, quite literally, all over the place, philosophy, science, literature. It was here, and not simply in the battle between different psychoanalytic orientations, that Lacan situated the real divide. Apart from the famous short sessions, intellectualization was the key word and the key insult aimed at what he was doing in his teaching 
which itself took place outside of psychoanalytic practice and had a universal destination. An insult aimed by analysts whom Lacan did not hesitate to insult back, calling them orthopedists of the unconscious and guarantors of the bourgeois dream. The alleged intellectualization was not due simply to Lacan's persona, his own intelligence, erudition, ambition, but to what he recognized to be at the very core of Freud's discovery, causing its main scandal. The unconscious thinks is how Lacan liked to formulate the gist of that discovery. Ingenious dreams, slips of the tongue, jokes, as well as many other highly spiritual forms and creations, are all manifestations of the work of the unconscious. There is nothing simply irrational about the unconscious. Lacan also liked to point out how the biggest scandal provoked by the Freudian notion of sexuality as related to the unconscious was not its alleged dirtiness, but the fact that it was so intellectual. It was in this respect that it showed itself to be worthy stooge of all those terrorists whose plots were going to ruin society. Lacan, Seminar 18. In this precise sense, to say that the satisfaction in talking, or in any kind of intellectual activity, is sexual, is not simply about abasement of intellectual activities. It is at least as much about elevating sexuality to a surprisingly intellectual activity. There is thus little doubt about where Lacan situated the most important divide and struggle in psychoanalysis. I would like to say to those who are listening to me how they could recognize bad psychoanalysts by the word they use to depreciate all research on technique and theory that furthers the Freudian experience in its authentic dimension. The word is intellectualization. Lacan, Seminar 18. If, however... The encounter between psychoanalysis and philosophy has proved to be a most inspiring and fruitful construction site for both. It seems that avoiding this site has recently become more and more of the mode d'ordre, or fashion, in both fields. Philosophers have rediscovered pure philosophy, and particularly ontology. Engaged as they are in producing new ontologies, they see little interest in what looks at best like a regional theory corresponding to a particular therapeutic practice. Lacanian psychoanalysts, on the other hand, are busy rediscovering the experimental, clinical core of their concepts, which they sometimes like to present as their holy grail, the ultimate real that they, and nobody else, are in touch with. In this respect, this book goes, both methodologically and ideologically, against the grain of the times we live in, refusing to abandon the construction site in favour of more polished conceptual products, services, or singular experiences. The pages that follow grew out of a double conviction. First, that in psychoanalysis, sex is above all a concept that formulates a persisting contradiction of reality, and second, that this contradiction cannot be circumscribed or reduced to a secondary level, as a contradiction between already well-established entities' beings, but is, as a contradiction, involved in the very structuring of these entities, in their very being. In this precise sense, sex is of ontological relevance, not as an ultimate reality, but as an inherent twist, or stumbling block, of reality. The question of Lacan and philosophy is thus taken up and tackled here at the point where the stakes appear to be highest. Sex is the question usually left out in even the most friendly philosophical appropriations of Lacan and his concepts. And ontology is something that Lacan saw as related to the discourse of the master, playing on the homonymy between maître, master, and maître, from being, être. Ontology implies being at someone's heel, being at someone's beck and call. And yet, or more precisely, exactly because of this, it seems imperative to posit the question of sex and ontology. It is here, I claim, that the destiny of the encounter between philosophy and psychoanalysis is being decided and played out. 
As Louis Althusser argued in his powerful essay on Marx and Freud, one of the things Marxism and psychoanalysis have in common is that they are situated within the conflict that they theorize. They are themselves part of the very reality that they recognize as conflictual and antagonistic. In such a case, the criterion of scientific objectivity is not a supposed neutrality, which is nothing other than a dissimulation, and hence the perpetuation, of the given antagonism, or of the point of real exploitation. In any social conflict, a neutral position is always and necessarily the position of the ruling class. It seems neutral because it has achieved the status of the dominant ideology, which always strikes us as self-evident. The criterion of objectivity in such a case is thus not neutrality, but the capacity of theory to occupy a singular, specific point of view within the situation. In this sense, the objectivity is linked here to the very capacity of being partial or partisan. As Althusser puts it, when dealing with a conflictual reality, which is the case for both Marxism and psychoanalysis, one cannot see everything from everywhere, on ne peut pas tout voir de partout. Some positions dissimulate this conflict, and some reveal it. One can thus discover the essence of this conflictual reality only by occupying certain positions, and not others, in this very conflict. What this book aims to show and argue is that sex, or the sexual, is precisely such a position or point of view in psychoanalysis not because of its dirty or controversial contents, but because of the singular form of contradiction that it forces us to see, to think, and to engage with. Although this may not be evident from its length, this book is the result of many years of conceptual work. This work has not been linear, but consisted of going forward and then coming back to the most difficult issues from different angles and perspectives, and finally of cutting out a lot of things, that is to say, words. Inevitably, several parts of this book have already appeared over those years as presentations of what has been ongoing research. In order to avoid any misunderstanding in this respect, however, I want to emphasize not only that this is not a collection of essays, which is quite obvious, but also that the already published parts constitute material which, quite simply, cannot pass for being the same in this book not only because it was significantly reshaped and modified at crucial conceptual points and junctures, but also because it is only in the present work that it becomes what it is, namely part of developing a central book-length argument. Recently, Lorenzo Chiesa's The Not To and Aaron Schuster's The Trouble with Pleasures books were published in this same series, books the topic of which intersect with mine in more than one respect. If these outstanding works do not play a significant part in my discussion, the reason is very simple. For many years we have been working on these topics in our parallel universes, in friendly complicity, yet each pursuing his or her particular obsession and path into the topics. I thought it best to maintain the independence of our parallel universes here, a decision that should not be mistaken for a lack of acknowledgement of these significant works.